Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today's the end of my second week of teaching on a subject that I've entitled Killing Sacred Cows. And I'm just talking about a, a combination of different things that are taught in the body of Christ that dilute and negate the real understanding of how much God loves us. And uh, I use uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 13, where Jesus says, You make the word of God of none effect through your tradition and doctrine of men. And people know that God loves us. They know that God's a good God. They'll say that, but then in their life, they still worry, they still fear, they still have lack of faith, which the Bible says, Galatians 5, 6, that faith works by love. If we really understood how much God loved us, we'd have faith. But the reason that people say they know this, but it doesn't seem to impact their life is because of these traditions and doctrines of man that negate and make the word of none effect. And so the very first week I countered the teaching on the sovereignty of God, that God controls everything that happens in your life. In my estimation, it's the worst doctrine that is out there in the body of Christ today. And then this week, I've been talking about how that we are redeemed from the Old Testament law. The average Christian today is still living as if they are under the Old Covenant law and that they have to perform and earn the blessing of God. I couldn't tell you how many, but there are thousands of people that have come to me for prayer that in some form or another express that they aren't worthy, they know they haven't done this, and they are trying to beg God and plead God. They don't understand that we are not under a performance-based relationship with God. God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we can believe and receive through Jesus. And it's because of this Old Testament law. So all of this week, I've been showing that we aren't under the law. Let me share this passage out of Romans chapter 5 and in verse 13. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. That is a radical passage of Scripture. You know, most people, it's a short verse, and they just pass over this, and they don't think about it. But to me, this is like one of the main Scriptures in the New Testament, that when there is no law, sin is not imputed. You know what this means? That prior to the giving of the law, which happened through Moses, which was approximately 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve, until the law came 2,000 years after the fall, God wasn't imputing people's sins unto him. What does the word impute mean? It's an accounting term. You know, back in the days when people used to write down, uh, you know, a, a ledger, and stuff. It means to record on the books, to put on the books is what it literally means. And what we could compare it to today is if you take a credit card, when you give a credit card and buy something, you didn't really pay for it with that credit card. All you did was on that credit card, there's a metal strip that has your information on it, and you get that sale imputed unto you. It's not paid for yet. It's just imputed unto you. It's put on the records and they send that bill to your credit card company, and then your credit card company bills you. And if you say, oh, no, I did pay for it. I gave them my credit card. A credit card doesn't pay for anything. It just imputes it unto you. And if you don't believe that, don't pay your credit card bill when it comes in and see if they'll say, well, you've already paid for it. No, you hadn't paid for it until you get the bill from the credit card company and then pay for it. So... The way we use a credit card, it's imputed unto you. In other words, it's held against you. It's recorded. But this says that sin is not imputed when there is no law. Prior to the law, God wasn't recording people's sins against them. Now, some people struggle with this. And again, this book goes into a lot more detail. I haven't got time to answer all of the things that I do in this book. But real quickly, let me just say that overall... God was merciful to people's sins. For instance, Abraham is a person that was called the friend of God. Genesis chapter 12, he was called and God blessed him and things began to happen. But it wasn't because Abraham did everything right. Abraham did some major mistakes. He lied about his wife twice and was willing to let other men take them and commit adultery with her to save his own skin. That was wrong. 
You know, sometimes we read these things in the Bible and we just skip over it, but it was wrong. It would be wrong for me if I went to a foreign country and somebody thought, oh man, your wife is awesome. I'd say, my wife? I don't know who she is. Help yourself. That would be wrong. I would be wrong. And it, it was wrong for Abraham to be able to do the same thing. Plus, Abraham did a bunch of things. When he couldn't have a child, his wife wanted him to take his her slave and have a relationship with her, and he produced an Ishmael. Abraham didn't do everything right. As a matter of fact, did you know that the woman he married, Sarah, his wife, was his half-sister? And according to Leviticus chapter 18, if you marry a half-sister, it's an abomination in the sight of God, and you have to be put to death for it. If Abraham would have been living under the law, he would have been put to death. But instead of being put to death, he was the blessed of the Lord because God wasn't imputing their sins unto him. He wasn't holding against them. It was only after the law came that God began to start treating people that way. You can take the very first person that broke the Old Testament law. It was a man who went and picked up sticks on the Sabbath day so he could make a fire and cook some food. But it was after the Sabbath had been instituted and he broke the command about not working on the Sabbath. So Moses took him and put him into like a prison, shut him up until he could hear from God. And God told him in an audible voice, he said, kill him, show him no mercy, stone him to death and make an example out of him. The very first person that broke the Old Testament law was put to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. But the very first person after the fall was Cain who went in and killed his brother Abel. And that wasn't right. It was wrong. Murder was wrong. But instead of God killing him, he extended mercy towards him and put a mark on Cain so that nobody would be able to, uh, if anybody killed him, that God would avenge their death. Can you see the difference between the law? When the, when the law came, sin began to be imputed, held against people, and people began to be punished for that sin. Prior to the law, people were not punished. And did you know that after the law, God is not imputing our sins unto us? Let me read this to you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that's just old English way of saying, here it is, this is what the ministry of reconciliation is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Remember Romans chapter 5, in verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself by not imputing their trespasses unto them. So until the law came, God wasn't imputing, recording people's sins against them. And after the law, the law ceased with Jesus. Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to all them that believe. Now, again, that's in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. It's not the end of the law. The law still exists, and it has a purpose, but not for the believer. It has a purpose for the unbeliever. We shared that out of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. But the law still exists for the people that don't know the Lord. But for those who have entered into the new covenant, we are not under the law. We are under grace. And this is saying that sin is not imputed when there is no law. We aren't under the law and God is not imputing sin unto us today. And it's reflected in this statement that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. We aren't under the law. The New Testament believer is not being judged and punished and rejected because of the law. You know, the average Christian today has somehow or another taken the New Te Covenant of Grace and mixed it with the Old Testament law. And this is really, this is really damaging. It would just be better to reject the new covenant of grace and say, I don't even believe in it, than it would be to say, oh, I agree with it partially, but we also have to keep the Old Testament law. It would be easier to counter the total 
misunderstanding and to mix it together. You know, this is what Paul was talking about over here in Galatians chapter 1. Let me turn over and read this. He was writing to these Galatians. He's the one that brought the gospel to them. And he said in Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He says, I'm shocked that you have left the pure gospel to go into something that is a perversion of the gospel. See, it would just be easier if people just flat out said, no, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't trust in Jesus. Jesus doesn't have anything to do with my salvation. It would be easier to counter that than it would to say, oh, yeah, I believe that you have to make Jesus your Lord. I believe that you have to trust in Jesus, but you also have to live holy and you have to do everything right. And God won't answer your prayers if you don't go to church and pay your tithes and do this. To mix the gospel with that is worse than to just totally reject the gospel. And somehow this is where the body of Christ is today. Our modern day church has perverted and has mixed this. And as you go through the book of Galatians, boy, Paul says some amazing things here. Like in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? Boy, he calls them foolish Galatians. You've been bewitched. This is a demonic deception. And then he says, this only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. He's talking about when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Did they do something to earn it or was it a gift from God? The obvious answer is it was a gift from God. And yet he says, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? And then, man, All of this is really good. I'm skipping some powerful verses here, but let me turn over to chapter 5, the conclusion of this letter. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This is talking about the Old Testament law. In verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Did you know circumcision was something that was demanded under the Old Testament law? And if a male wasn't circumcised, they had to be killed. It was punishable by death. It was one of the foundation principles of the Old Testament law. And here's Paul saying that if you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Of course, Paul himself was circumcised. He said that over in Philippians chapter 3 that he was circumcised on the eighth day. So he's not saying that if you've had this rite of circumcision uh, done to you that somehow or another you are incapable of ever having a relationship. But he's saying if you are trusting in that, if you are putting your faith in what you've done instead of what Jesus did for you, Christ will profit you nothing. You know, that's a huge statement right here. And I guarantee you there are people watching this program right now that you believe in Jesus, you you believe that you've made Jesus your Lord, and yet Christ isn't profiting you anything right now. You aren't getting healed. You know God could heal, but you aren't seeing it. You, you aren't prosperous. You aren't enjoying life. You're depressed. You're discouraged. Christ is profiting you nothing, and yet you say you believe all of the right things. What's wrong? It's probably exactly what he's talking about, that you have perverted the gospel of Christ. You have mixed it with your own performance, and you think that somehow or another you have to be worthy and earn this instead of just basking in the presence of God through faith in Jesus. You are somehow or another feeling disqualified and unworthy to receive. And he goes on and he says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. And again, this isn't talking about if you are circumcised. It's talking about if your faith is in that. If you are trusting in the fact that you were a Jew because you were circumcised, then you have to do the whole law. You can't just do one part of it and become circumcised. You've got to also, you've got to keep the whole law. You are a debtor to the whole law. And then he says in verse 4, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Those are some strong, strong statements. And sad to say, this is exactly what's happened in our modern day church. 
You know, this was talking about circumcision. It's just one of the principles of the law. But you could say today, if you are trusting in your church attendance, if you are trusting in your Bible study, if you are trusting in how much you pray, if you are trusting in your holy living that you don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do, if you're trusting in any of these things, if this is what makes you accepted to God, you are falling from grace. Christ is profiting you nothing. And I can guarantee you this is where a lot of people are. A lot of people are trusting in their own goodness. And I know that there are people watching this thinking, does that really happen? I tell you, I minister to people a lot. And I have people come up in my prayer lines. And if I've heard this once, I've heard it a thousand times. People saying something like, why hasn't God healed me? I fast, I pray, I study the Word, I pay my tithes, I do this. And they talk about all that they've done. Why haven't, hasn't God healed me? Did you know by you saying that, you've told me why God hasn't healed you? Because you didn't point to what He did for you through Jesus, but instead you're pointing to what you are doing for Him, and it reveals that your faith is in yourself. It's in your performance. You are under the law. Again, you may say, well, no, I'm not under the law. I don't observe the feast days, and I don't offer animal sacrifices. You may not do the things that were prescribed in the old law, but you just now have a New Testament law. It's the same principle. It's the same mindset that you've got to do one through ten before God will answer your prayer. That's the law. That's exactly what the law was saying. You had to perform. But remember those verses I started with that were... There is no law. God doesn't impute sin. We aren't under the law now, and God is not holding sin against us. Go back to this example of the credit card. You know, a credit card, when you pay for something, you didn't really pay for it at that moment. You just had it imputed unto you. There's information on that credit card. What if I went to pay for something, and God just comes up and pushes me out of the way and says, put it on my credit card? Man, if he did that, and paid for what I did. There is no way that I would let them send me a bill and say, well, I know that God paid for what you purchased, but you're the one who got it. You ought to pay something. No, if God paid for it, I'm not going to pay for it again. And I'm not going to pay, you know, 20% or 5% or anything. If he paid for the whole thing, why not let him pay for it? But in a sense, see, Jesus paid for all of our sins, and yet Christians are coming along and still feeling like, but I sinned, I did wrong. And because of that, you, can't, you just can't believe that God would really love you and accept you because you did so wrong. You just do not understand that He's already paid for all of this. Matter of fact, I was over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I was reading about how that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their sins unto them, and then look down in verse 21, it says, For he hath made him, talking about God the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God the Father, he paid our debt. He paid a debt that we couldn't pay. It was bigger than any of us could pay. He paid it by making Jesus become sin for us, and then he not only wiped out our debt, but then he put to our credit all of the goodness of God. We not only got our sins wiped away, but we had the righteousness of God imputed unto us. We had our sin imputed to Jesus, and Jesus' righteousness imputed to us. Man, that's awesome. And because of this, God looks at you and sees you just as if you had never sinned. There is no stain of sin. He's not imputing your sins unto you. And it says here that He committed to us this word of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for the Lord, and we are beseeching you in His stead, be you reconciled unto God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the Old Testament law was not sin. It was perfect, but we were sin. And because of our imperfection, we could never live up to it. Therefore, that which was perfect and holy and pure actually became a condemning, a damaging thing to us because all of us had sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so instead of receiving the blessing, we received the curse. 
and it, it ministers death, it ministers separation, it ministers condemnation, it makes us guilty, it makes sin come alive, and the law that was good actually became negative to us. It was good in the sense that it showed us our sin and made us turn from it and throw ourselves on the mercy of God. But beyond that purpose, it ministered guilt, condemnation, death, all of these kind of things. And a New Testament believer is not supposed to be relating to God based on how good you live, but instead on what Jesus did for you. And somebody's probably listening to this and thinking, hey man, it's great news. Now I can just go live in sin because I'm not under the law. You ought to get saved. If you ever, if you understand what I'm talking about, the love of God that was so exhibited towards us in pain for all of our sins, past, present, and even future sins, that is so awesome that if you really receive that, it would make you serve God more accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. You would live for God holier under grace than you ever did under legalism. You know, I'm really glad that God gave me this message and called me to preach this message because you can't say that I'm preaching this so that we can go live in sin. You know, this is foolish. It's like Paul said. He says, I'm speaking like a lost man. I would never say this except just to make my point. But in comparison to people, I've lived better than most people. I'm living holier than most of you watching this have ever thought about. I've never taken a drink of liquor, never smoked a cigarette, never said a word of profanity. I've never tasted coffee. Amen. I have lived a separated life. You can't say that I'm preaching about the grace of God so that I can go live in sin. That is not true. The grace of God, it says, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. If you truly understand the grace of God, it's not going to free you to sin, but it'll free you from the guilt and the penalty of sin. And it'll make you serve God more accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. Boy, this is awesome. You know, I've said some amazing things this week, and this is something that I could have spent literally a month or two just ministering on this one thing. I'm, I'm through with this this week. Next week, I'm going to move on to the next thing. But I do have this book entitled The True Nature of God that will explain what I've talked about this week in more detail. And I promise you, this would transform your life. I've had many people tell me that this was just a turning point in their life. I would love to have you get this. So we've got not only the CD set on killing sacred cows, but I've got a DVD set where I taught it live. I got a DVD set that were taken from television programs. We've got this book. And I encourage you to listen to our announcer. Today's my last day to make this second teaching entitled Split Personality available to you as a gift. So listen to our announcer and then please call or write today.